Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lynn Clark, and I make Hill cartoons. And I also work at Mozilla. I'm in the advanced development group. Uh, we work on things like Rust and on WebAssembly. And tonight I'll be talking about the latest thing that we've been working on, which is WASI, the WebAssembly system interface. So basically what we're doing is creating a standard way to run WebAssembly outside of the browser. And you might not have heard of this before because we just announced it last month. So I'll explain at a high level the why, the what, and the who. And then we can start diving into some of the actual details of this system interface. So first off, why? Why would you want to run WebAssembly outside of the browser? And you know, it's funny, the first time I gave this talk was the day after we made the announcement. Uh, so I was drafting the talk right after I sent out the tweet um, for the announcement. And I was at exactly this point in my draft when this tweet came in from the co-founder of Docker. Um, so he says, if WASM and WASI existed in 2008, we wouldn't have needed to create Docker. That's how important it is. WebAssembly on the server is the future of computing. And uh, I want to say that this is not the only use case where running WebAssembly outside of the browser could be helpful. It can be helpful for things like Node, um, for other kinds of cloud and serverless applications, for the blockchain, uh, for things like portable CLI tools, um, the Internet of Things, and more than that. Uh, and I've talked about these use cases before in a post, uh, an article that I co-authored with Till Schneiderite and Luke Wagner about the post-MVP future of WebAssembly. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. If you want to learn more about the different use cases, you can check out that article. Um, but I do want to talk about some of the reasons, the common reasons between all these use cases, why WebAssembly makes sense. Um, so first off, WebAssembly is fast. It gives you the ability to run code at near native speeds. And it's not just that the code runs fast. Um, it can also give you fast startup times. Um, and VMs that are built for WebAssembly can actually start up more quickly than VMs that are built for things like JavaScript. So for example, um, Fastly is using WebAssembly to handle requests for their serverless platform. And they do this by spinning up a new virtual machine instance on every single request. Uh, and they can only do this because they can instantiate the WebAssembly module in under 50 microseconds. Um, so for comparison, if you are doing the same kind of thing with JavaScript and V8, it takes about five milliseconds. Um, so the next thing is that WebAssembly is safe. With WebAssembly, it's easier to keep things secure than it is when you have a binary that's running directly on your machine. And I'll talk about this more later in the talk. Um, the third thing is that WebAssembly is portable. Uh, the same WebAssembly file can be run in a bunch of different runtimes across different kinds of machines using different kinds of operating systems. And this means that you don't have to do things like compiling your module specifically for every device you're targeting. And WebAssembly is also scalable. Um, it takes a lot less uh, memory to run a WebAssembly VM than it does a JavaScript VM. So I mentioned Fastly before. Um, their WebAssembly runtime only requires a few kilobytes of memory overhead compared to tens of megabytes with V8. So this means that they can fit tens of thousands of simultaneously running programs in the same process. Um, as opposed to if you were using V8, you could only do hundreds. So that's why you would want to run WebAssembly outside of the browser. Now let's look at the what, the what of WASI, uh, what it actually is. When I was introducing WebAssembly, I talked about how it was an assembly language for concept a conceptual machine, not for an actual physical machine. This is why it can run across a bunch of different machine architectures. Um, it's very close to the assembly language that most machines use, so the runtime only needs to make a small jump from the WebAssembly to the assembly language for the machine that that runtime's running on. Um, so it goes from this assembly for the conceptual machine to the assembly for the actual machine. Just as WebAssembly is an assembly language for a conceptual machine, WebAssembly needs a system interface for a conceptual operating system, not for any single operating system. This way it can be run across a whole bunch of different operating systems. And this is what WASI is, the system interface for the WebAssembly platform. Now, who's doing this work? Um, WASI is being standardized by the WebAssembly community group. We've chartered a subgroup to work on it, and you can find out more in the WebAssembly slash WASI repo. So if you want to get involved in this work, you have a couple of options. Um, 
if you have you know deep understanding of operating systems and um, you know have some ideas about how this uh, standard could work, you can join the CG and work on the standardization. Uh, or you can start contributing to one of the implementations, such as WASM time, which is the WebAssembly runtime that we're working on at Mozilla. Or if you have an existing project that you know might be able to use WASI, you can feel free to get in touch with us and we would be happy to talk more about it. Um, for example, we've been talking with the Node folks about how they could possibly use WASI um, so that you could have native Node modules, no, modules that are written in C, and um, which typically in Node have to be compiled, you know, either uh, delivered as a binary or compiled on the device. Um, we could do that with WASI instead, so that those modules would be portable in the same way the JavaScript modules in Node are portable. So now with all of that covered, let's talk about WASI in more detail. So. Um, a lot of people talk about languages like C giving you direct access to system resources, but that's not quite true. Uh, these languages don't have direct access to things. Um, they can't do things like open or create files on most systems directly. Why not? Because these system resources, such as files, memory, network connections, they're too important to the stability and security of your computer. If one program unintentionally messes with the resources of another, then it could crash the program. Even worse, if a program or user intentionally messes with the resources of another, it could leak sensitive data. So we need a way to control which programs and users can access which resources. People figured this out pretty early on uh, and came up with a way to provide this kind of control, um, which is protection ring security. So with protection ring security, the operating system basically puts a protective barrier around the system's resources. And this is the kernel. The kernel is the only thing that gets to do operations like creating a new file or opening a file or opening a network connection. The user's program actually runs outside of this kernel in something called user mode. And if a program wants to do anything like open the file, it has to ask the kernel to open the file for it. And this is where this concept of a system call comes in. When the program needs to ask the kernel to do one of these things, it asks using a system call. So this gives the kernel a chance to figure out uh, which user is asking. And then it can see if that user has access to the file before it does the operation, before it opens it or um, changes it. On most devices, this is the only way that your code can access the system's resources through system calls. Um, and the operating system is what makes these system calls available. But if each operating system has its own system calls, wouldn't you need a different version of your code for every single operating system? Fortunately, you don't. So how is this problem solved? Through abstraction. Most languages provide a standard library. So while coding, the programmer doesn't need to know which system they'll be targeting in the end. They just use that interface. And then when compiling, the toolchain picks out which implementation of that interface to use based on whichever system you're targeting. So this implementation uses fit functions from the operating systems API. That means it's specific to that operating system. And this is where that system interface comes in. So for example, PUTC being compiled for Windows um, could use the Windows API to interact with the machine. Um, but if it's being compiled for Mac or Linux, it would use POSIX instead. This poses a problem for WebAssembly, though. With WebAssembly, you don't know what kind of operating system you're going to be targeting, even when you're compiling. So you can't use any single operating system's interface inside the WebAssembly implementation of the standard library. I've talked before about how WebAssembly is an assembly language for the conceptual <coughs> machine. You know, I talked about that in my intro, not for the real machine. And in the same way, we need this conceptual system interface for the conceptual operating system, not a real operating system. But there are already runtimes that can run WebAssembly outside of the browser, even without having that interface in place. So how are they doing it? Let's take a look. So the first tool for producing WebAssembly was Inscripted. It emulates a particular operating system sister interface um, 
POSIX, on the web. And so that means that the programmer can use functions from the C standard library, libc. To do this, mscripten created its own implementation of libc. And this implementation was split in two. Part of it was compiled into the WebAssembly module, and the other part was implemented in JS Glue code that would interact with the system. You know, that JS Glue code would call into the browser, and that would then talk to the operating system. And most of the early WebAssembly code was compiled using mscripten. So when people started wanting to run WebAssembly code outside of the browser, they started by making this mscripten compiled code run. So that meant that these runtimes needed to create their own implementations for all of these functions that were in the JS Glue code. And this is where the problem comes in. The interface provided by the JS Glue code wasn't designed to be a standard or even to be a public interface at all, because that wasn't the problem that it was trying to solve. So for example, um, for a function that would be called something like read in an API that was designed to be a public API, um, the JS Glue code instead uses underscore system three, uh, the first parameter which um, is an integer, which is always the same number as what's in the name, so three in this case. And the second parameter, var args, is um, it's the arguments to use, and you, know, you can tell from the name, uh, there's a variable number of them. Um, but WebAssembly doesn't provide a way to pass in a variable number of arguments to a function. So instead, the arguments are passed in via linear memory, via the heap, basically. Now, this isn't type safe, and it's also slower than it would be if you could pass these in using registers. Um, and that was fine for mscripten that was running in the browser. But now runtimes are treating this as a de facto standard. Um, and they're implementing their own versions of this JS code. So they're emulating an internal detail of an emulation layer of POSIX. This means that they're re-implementing choices like the passing in arguments as heap values that made sense based on mscripten's constraints, even though those constraints don't apply in their environments. If we're going to build a WebAssembly ecosystem that lasts for decades, we need solid foundations. So this means that our de facto standard can't be an emulation of an emulation. But what principles should we apply? There are two important principles that are baked into WebAssembly, portability and security. We need to maintain these two key principles as we move to these outside the browser use cases. Um, as it is, POSIX and Unix's access control approach to security don't quite get us there. So let's look at where those fall short and We'll start this with port portability. Um, POSIX provides source code portability. You can compile the same source code with different versions of libc to target different machines. But WebAssembly needs to go one step beyond this. We need to be able to compile once and run across a whole bunch of different machines. So we need portable binaries. This kind of portability makes it much easier to distribute code to users. So for example, if Node's native modules were written in WebAssembly, as I was mentioning before, then users wouldn't need to run Node JIP when they install apps with native modules, and developers wouldn't need to configure and distribute dozens of binaries. Now let's look at security. When a line of code asks the operating system to do some input or output, the operating system needs to determine if it's safe to do what the code is asking it to do. Now, operating systems typically handle this with access control that's based on ownership and groups. So for example, um, the program might ask the OS to open a file, um, and a user has access to a certain set of files. Um, when the user starts the program, the program is running on behalf of that user. Um, so that means that if the user has access to the file, either because they are the owner or because they're in a group that has access to it, then the program has that same access to it. That protects users from each other. And that made a lot of sense when the early operating systems were developed, because systems were usually multi-user, um, and administrators controlled what software was installed. So the biggest threat that you had as a user was that other users were going to take a peek at your files. But that's changed now. Systems now are usually single user, but they're running code that pulls in lots of other third-party code of unknown trustworthiness. So now the biggest threat that you have is that the code that you yourself are running is going to turn against you. So for example, let's say that 
uh, you have a library that you're using in an application and that library gets a new maintainer. You know, often happens in open source. That maintainer might have your interests, your best interests at heart, or they might be one of the bad guys. And if they have access to do anything on your system, for example, open any of your files and send them over the network, then your code, that code can do a lot of damage. So this is why using third-party libraries that can talk directly to the interests. WebAssembly's way of doing security is different. WebAssembly is sandboxed. So this means that the code can't talk directly to the operating system. But then how does it do anything with the system's resources? The host, which may be the browser or maybe a WebAssembly runtime, puts functions into the sandbox that the code can use. And this means that the host can limit what a program can do on a program by program basis. So it doesn't just let the program act on behalf of the user calling any system call with the user's full permissions. Um, but just having this mechano mechanism for sandboxing doesn't make a system secure in and of itself. The host could still put all of the capabilities into the sandbox, in which case we're no better off than we were before. But at least it gives hosts the option of creating a more secure system. So in any system interface we design, we need to uphold these two principles from WebAssembly. Portability makes it easier to develop and distribute code, and providing the tools for hosts to secure themselves and their users is an absolute must. Given those two key principles, what should the design of a WebAssembly system interface look like? Well, that's what we're going to figure out through the standardization process. We do have a proposal to start with, though. This proposal is to create a modular set of standard, library, uh, standard interfaces and starting with standardizing the most fundamental module, which is WASI Core. So what will be in WASI Core? Well, WASI Core will contain the basics that all programs need. It will cover much of the same ground as POSIX, including things such as files, network connections, clocks, and random numbers. And we'll take a very similar approach to POSIX for many of these things. So for example, we use uh, POSIX's file-oriented approach where you have system calls such as open, close, read, and write, and everything else uh, basically provides augmentations on top of that. But WASI core won't cover everything that POSIX does. So for example, um, the process concept doesn't map clearly on to WebAssembly. Uh, and beyond that, it doesn't make sense to say that every WebAssembly engine needs to support process operations like Fork but we do want to make it possible to standardize fork. So this is where this modular approach comes in. This way we can get good standardization coverage while still allowing niche platforms to use only the parts of WASI that make sense for them. So how will this be used? Well, languages like Rust will use WASI core directly in their standard libraries. So for example, Rust's uh, open is implemented by calling WASI path open when it's compiled to WebAssembly. For C and C++, we've created a WASI sysroot that implements libc in terms of WASI core functions. And we expect compilers like Clang to be ready to interface with um, the WASI API and complete tool chains like Rust-C and Inscriptin to use WASI as part of their system implementations. And in fact, Rust already does have support. It actually had support um, starting uh, at the very beginning of WASI uh, announcement uh, because of the amazing work of Alex Craig. So how does the user's code call these WASI functions? The runtime that is running the code passes the WASI core functions in as imports. This gives us portability because each host can have their own implementation of WASI core that is specially written for their platform. So from WebAssembly runtimes like our WASM time and Fastly's Lucid um, to Node or even the browser. It also gives us sandboxing because the host can choose which WASI core functions to pass in, so which system calls to allow on a program-by-program -program basis. So this preserves the security that I was talking about before. But WASI also gives us a way to extend the security even further. It brings in more concepts from capabilities-based security. Um, traditionally, if code needs to open a file, it calls open with a string, which is the path name of that file. And then the OS does a check to see if the code has permission based on the user who started the program. With WASI, if you're calling a function that needs to access a file, 
you have to pass in a file descriptor, which has permissions attached to it. This could be for the file itself, or it could be for a directory that contains the file. This way, you can't have code that randomly asks to open etc password. Instead, the code can only operate on the directories that are passed into it. So this makes it possible to safely give sandbox code more access to the different system calls, because the capabilities of these system calls can be limited. And this happens on a module-by-module -module basis, so a finer-grained basis, by finer-grained level. By default, a module doesn't have any access to file descriptors. But if code in one module has a file descriptor, it can choose to pass it, that file descriptor, to a function it calls in other modules. Or it can create a more limited version of the file descriptor to pass to other functions. So the runtime passes in the file descriptors that an app can use to the top level code, and then the file descriptors get propagated through the rest of the system on an as-needed basis. This gets WebAssembly closer to the principle of least authority, where a module can only access the exact resources it needs to do its job. And as I mentioned, uh, these concepts come from capability-oriented systems like Cloud ABI or Capsicum. Now, one problem with capability-oriented systems is that they're often, it's often hard to port code to those systems. But we think that this problem can be solved. If code already uses system calls like OpenAT, uh, I think fopen, um, with relative file paths, compiling the code will just work. Um, one case where it won't just work is if that code uses open. Uh, if the code uses open and migrating to the open at style is too much upfront investment, WASI can provide an incremental solution. So with uh, a library called libpreopen, you can create a list of file paths that the application legitimately needs access to. And then you can use open, but just with those paths. So what's next? Well, we think WASI core is a good start. It preserves WebAssembly's portability and security, providing a solid foundation for an ecosystem. But there are still questions that we'll need to address after WASI core, or while WASI core is being standardized. And those questions include asynchronous I.O., um, file watching, file locking, and others. This is just the beginning, so if you have ideas for how to solve these problems, please join us. So uh, I want to thank my collaborators on developing this talk, Dan Goman, who's the lead developer on WASI and our WebAssembly runtime, WASM time, uh, Til Schneiderite, who is the, uh, the manager of our developer technologies team, focusing on Rust and WebAssembly, and also Dan's manager, um, and Luke Wagner, who's one of WebAssembly's creators and a driving force in all things WebAssembly. So thank you to all of them, and thank you all for listening. Questions? Okay, I saw that hand go up first, and then... So, um, uh, it's about sandboxing, right? Like, you mentioned security, and you want to... Uh, nobody should, like, give you when you run an app, uh, you shouldn't just access everything that I have in my hand, and stuff. Um, there is existing uh, solutions for that, um, yeah. desktop at least, uh, especially uh, that I um, use the most is the Flatpak. Um, <coughs> do you know about Flatpak? I'm not familiar with Flatpak. There are a number of <coughs> solutions for um, addressing this. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about how Flatpak works? Um, well, it's, a, it's also like a container solution in a, specifically meant for desktop solutions. So, um, for example, if an app accesses, for example, my location, it has uh, something called portal that you know asks the user, "This app is accessing your location. You want it to mm -hmm. uh, access your location, stuff like that." Also, when it accesses file system, so it uh, it has like a limited uh, file browser, um, so only files that you it has it should have access to can only access these and stuff like that. So it has something called portals to, to handle that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering how. You intend to have interaction with, like, uh, I have a Bazi application. How does it interact with the platform? Would it have like specific platform solutions in, in the Bazi somehow? You're talking about if you're running Wazi inside of one of those solutions. Yeah. I don't actually know. Till do you know? Um, it's these are really um, different solutions to some of the same issues. Um, Everything that 
exists right now is either very operating specific or much more heavyweight. Um, that certainly includes Flatpak, that includes Docker containers, um, and um, then there are approaches for different operating systems, but you lose all portability and have to implement the same thing quite a number of times. And so this wouldn't integrate okay. with Flatpak. It, it's really an alternative solution. Oh, you're. Yeah, so do you see, um, so, so I guess the first part is, uh, are there any plans to add a sort of system call um, layer on top of Linux or Windows to, to support this directly? And would you see this as something where uh, either they converged or there's, I don't know, an operating system that's written that, that natively supports WASI as a system call layer as a, a reason to kind of, you know, for performance reasons? Or would you say it should always run as a sort of a user space library that can then mm -hmm. convert those calls into something that supports the kernel? So Till might have some thoughts on this as well. Um, you do. I can see in the face. <laughs> you go ahead. Um, we had a, uh, a Google Summer of Code student last year, Lachlan Snap, um, uh, who implemented this operating system kernel called Nebula. There was a WebAssembly operating system, essentially, where uh, processes were WebAssembly instances. And you could. Um, conceive of real use cases where this would make sense. It certainly wouldn't make sense for all environments, but um, if you want to have something that's really very bare metal, then you could imagine essentially doing away with all of the operating system and implementing the WASI calls directly um, as, as close to the actual hardware. So would that be like an IoT sort of use case? Maybe? <coughs> Are there any other questions? I don't know how long we have to do questions I either. We have a few, uh, another many or something. Okay. In the back there. Uh, there is a really long big discussion on the internet about gar implementing garbage collection in Wazi. Uh, do you know your ideas? So that's uh, on Web in WebAssembly, not in Wazi itself. Oh. Um, so uh, there's active work on that. Um, and Till is also involved in that. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think that it, so you said you'd be interested in our opinion, do you mean on how valuable it is or on yeah, when it's going to happen? <laughs> is it a good idea or not? Or, uh, because it's web assembly, it's assembly, so it shouldn't have maybe some uh, basic knowledge of... So one of the nice things about it is that it's not actually being... Um, not all runtimes need to support it. Only runtimes that want to. It basically allows you to put the host's uh, garbage collector in, uh, to integrate, rather, with the host garbage collection. Um, if you have a WebAssembly runtime that doesn't integrate with JavaScript or another language's language that um, has a garbage collector, you don't need to uh, implement it, and there's no performance um, penalty at all. For it. So um, it really is an optional feature. Uh, and I think it makes a lot of sense for cases like running WebAssembly on the web when you are inter interoperating with a language that needs GC support. Have you been thinking about the uh, like yield and scheduling of threats? Um, so uh, I, there's some. You're talking about WASI, whether or not we would have asynchronous system calls, or... Well, well actually, yes, that, and also, uh, you have to model your operating system somehow, so do you assume that it's like scheduling in place? I mean, in timers, you have to place actions into the future that has to be handled, mm -hmm. but what about like pinning threads down onto different CPUs? Do you expose that knowledge of the I system? I don't know. Do you know if Dan's done anything? Planning around that? Um, there's so there there are certainly no beginnings of a real design, um, but uh, one thing is very clear: um, just having multi-threading exposed at all, shared memory, um, and then being able to spawn additional threads, that would probably be a capability in itself that you have to explicitly request, and then doing things like pinning threads to specific cores would almost certainly be a different capability because it allows you to do things like observe timing in, in 
voice with number A's and so on. Um, but how we will end up uh, specifying all of those things exactly, uh, that is really for the subgroup of the web assembly CG to figure out once it starts and what. Okay, so there are no faults on, on Luma or any other big systems? No, not yet. Not yet. One more? Okay. Oh, now there's. How do I pick? <laughs> Uh, right. <laughs> so, uh, how do you specify the capabilities? How do you specify, like, how do you pass them into a function, you mean? Yeah, or how does my runtime uh, request what capabilities my application needs to the OS? So, um, that is kind of an open question that, um, you know, uh, so basically, runtimes will make their own decisions about um, how to allow users to select what they want to do or whether or not to set defaults. Um, and uh, we actually have an open uh, research grant to explore this user experience. All right, then um, I think all of the speakers are sticking around for a yes. little bit afterwards. So feel free to ask questions.